Thank you for joining us on the Rose Church Podcast. For more information about this podcast or other resources, please visit rosechurch.org or follow us on social media at Rose Church PDX. I usually get to preach three times a Sunday. I get one time today, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for my one time today. So usually I get three times, like go through all day. I get one shot today, and just to let you know, uh, I, I am ready to preach today. And if you're a visitor today, welcome. I know that today can be very overwhelming. Like this is a new, it's a big room. You know, worship and karaoke was way too loud. And beach balls, what are you like at a concert? You know, like... I get today could be a little overwhelming for you today, but I'm so glad that you came. I know for many of you, to even like darken the doors of a church is a big step for you. And, you know, I know maybe your girlfriend, wife, neighbor, you know, maybe on social media someone tags you and you decided to come. Thank you for being here. And uh, we're going to go to the Bible today. And so I'm going to preach hard and preach quick so we can get some worship back in and uh, some other things. But I believe I have a word for you today and for us as a church. And if once again, if you're a visitor or maybe you haven't been in our church in a while, and this is this is going to be kind of a um, a big family discussion, if you will. This is going to be a big table that we're in a family discussion around. Go with me to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua. Chapter 3. I mean, the piano makes me just feel so spiritual up here. <laughs> Joshua 3, you there? Oh, good, four of you. So the other 800 of you, let's find, let's find Joshua 3. It's going to be on the screen for you. If you don't have a Bible, no worries whatsoever. Um, you can follow along with us on this massive big Bible on the screen. We're going to read about 15 verses um, just to give you context to the whole, uh, the whole passage that I want to read. But I'm going to give you some specific phrases on which I want to talk about today. Here we go. Early the next morning, Joshua. Now, context, uh, Moses, right, has rescued the people out of Egypt, out of Pharaoh. They've made it all the way through the 40 years of the um, desert, uh, and they finally have gotten to the promised land. They're standing in front of the river. The other side of the river is the promise, right? The big deal that God's been doing all the Old Testament. This is the three days before this happens, okay? So early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left uh, Achaia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. Hear this. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the presence of God or the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about a half mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves, for the morrow of the Lord will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift up the ark of the covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all of the Israelites, and they will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give them this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, hear this, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gizzizzites, Amorites, all the ites, the Jebusites. <laughs> Ahead of you, look. The Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord and the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose 12 men for the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. We're going to end here soon. The priests will carry the Ark of the Lord and the Lord of all the earth. And as soon, hear this today, as soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of the water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Last two verses. It was harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing in its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at river's edge, the water above that point began to backing up like a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all of the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. 
My title for our talk this morning, my message, is simply a question. We are crossing over, are you? We are crossing over, are you? Let's pray as we dive into Joshua chapter 3. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are here that you are speaking to us, God. We thank you that you are calling us up and out, God. Even I just pray for even our college starting today, God, and the announcements, the applications, everything going today, God, that your presence would lead us. And God, even today is such a holy moment, such a special moment in our church's history. Jesus, we pray you'd be here as we spend a few moments on your word and consider Joshua chapter 3 and what you would say to our church today. In your mighty name I pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Um, we have a weird relationship with change. Have you noticed this yet? That we all want it, but we all hate it at the same time. Like we want new clothes, we want new cars, we want a new home, we want a new job, we want a new position. Uh, sometimes we want new relationships, new whatever. We, we actually really, really want change, but we hate it when it comes. And, or transitions, right? We don't really like transitions. But I don't know about you, but have you ever met these people that have never transitioned to their new season of life? It's like this. College students, that all they ever talk about is junior high or like high school. They're like, oh, yeah, man, junior summer was amazing. Right? Dude, you're 22. Like, you should get past the high school thing. It wasn't that good. Or, right, early you know, married people, whatever, like, oh, college was the thing. And they still act like they're in college. Or like, let's get really practical. It goes this way. Like, married people that still act like they're not married. Like, guys, like, like not that way. Calm down. Okay. So you're like, oh, church. Okay. No, not that way but like especially guys that like haven't made the transition like I can't just do whatever I want anymore and like just have people over whenever I want or whatever like I haven't made the transition well um today we are making a transition this new building that is coming up um college um things that we are stepping into in our church just started 18 months ago to sit here today and think that 19 months ago we were in my mother-in-law's living room with 22 people and then we started, that's my mother-in-law. Um, <laughs> and then, woo! Uh, you know, then you probably drove by it today, Cup and Bar and MLK with 90 people that showed up for our first meeting, and now we're here. And, and this, is the, this is the thing. After today, we can't go back. We are crossing over into a new season of the college, a new season of a building, a permanent home. No more set up and tear down. You're welcome, set up and tear down team. Um, but the thing about today is, this moment, this room, announcing a college, buying a building, we are crossing over a river. So my question to you is, we are crossing over, are you? Are you gonna cross over with us? And today is a a historical, monumental day, and I would like to say to you just even publicly, we are not going back. We're not going back to the old. We're not going back to the comfortable. We're not going back to the easy. We are crossing over, and I love Joshua 3 because Moses just died, and Joshua's first task is to make a transition. He hasn't done anything yet. Moses just died. The people miss him. They miss Moses. Joshua's the new leader. And the first thing that Moses, after he's dead, the first thing that Joshua has to do is cross a river. Make a transition. I want to give you four thoughts today about crossing over. Four thoughts today from Joshua 3 about crossing over. Uh, number one is uh, let his presence lead. I love Joshua 3 because we write it right in the beginning. He says, um, you've never been this way before. So let the ark lead. Do the ark represented, maybe if you weren't raised in church, or like, what, what is the ark? No, it's not just the thing from, um, you know, old movies and what people see, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, whatever it might be. Um, the ark was represented God, represented his tangible, physical, the Bible calls it Shekinah glory, like his, his presence was in a box. And so what is God saying? You've never been this way before, so let my presence lead you. Can I say to you right now, where we're going, I've never been there before. Listen, I did not plan this, to buy a building and start a college in the same month. That was not my plan. It was not my plan whatsoever. I even got to the point a few months ago, to be honest, like, maybe we should put a hold on the college for a while while we're doing the building thing. But we felt peace to go forward. And hear me, I'm just, once again, welcome to a big family conversation, okay? This is the first time in my church history 
like me being involved in church, which is over 10 years, like full-time staff. It's the first time, I said this to Julia the other day, it's the first time in my leadership life I don't know what I'm doing. Some of you are like, oh. <laughs> Maybe this is not the church for us. <laughs> no, the other day I was praying about the college and about today and hoping that you would show up and fill the room. And I go, God, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And I said this phrase. I go, God, for the first time, I'm in over my head. And I felt the presence of God, the spirit of Jesus say, finally. And I was like, finally what? He was like, you can't lean on you anymore. You know why? Because we, Rose Church, we are going somewhere that we've never been before. And, and we need his presence to lead us. Can I submit to you? If you feel out of control of your life, it's the safest place you'll ever be. You being out of control, you not having every detail figured out, you not having the next two years, you actually being out of control and letting God be in control, and you start living in a season of life going, I don't know where I'm going, and his presence starts leading. I feel that not just God is asking Rose Church to cross over on some things. He's asking you personally to cross over on some things. Cross over some things in your marriage, in your business, in your finances. Maybe God's asking you to step out. There's a, there's a season that God's saying, come on, cross over. And it goes like this. I don't know where to go. I know. So how do I know the way? My presence will lead you. But here we go. This is what I want to talk about for a little bit. He says specifically the Ark of the Covenant, right? The box, which was God's presence. Fast forward a couple thousand years to the New Testament. God's no longer in a box. The Bible says that when Jesus was crucified on, on Calvary and his flesh was ripped open and his body was mutilated and our sins were forgiven for eternity, and it was a gift, a free gift, by the way, if you're not a Jesus follower today, that gift is available for you today. And the Bible says this, when he said, it is finished, the veil was torn from head to toe. The veil, by the way, in Old Testament, New Testament, the veil was where one priest, one time, aware, one time a year, the high priest could go behind the veil and be in the very presence of God. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says the veil was ripped. In other words, the thing that kept man distant from God is now gone. You see, you see, the veil ripping wasn't just letting God out, it was letting man in. And now the, the presence of God is no longer in a box, it's not in a, in a physical space, it's not behind an ark. And then the Bible says when Jesus goes back up to heaven, he says this to his disciples, it was better that I leave. It's better. No, it's not, by the way, Jesus. It's not better. He goes, no, because if I don't leave, the helper the comforter cannot come. See, this is so important. And in the book of Acts, right, the church starts in a prayer meeting, by the way. That's how church started, in a prayer meeting with the Holy Spirit. Now, maybe you're in this room today, and you're like, the vibe is fun, the fog was kind of cool, the uh, waffle window was free, and that's great, but this room's kind of fun and vibey. Let me just put the record straight. You've walked into a room with a bunch of people that are really into the spirit and the presence of Jesus, and what you feel is not a light, a sound, a room, or a vibe. It's the person of the Holy Spirit, and this is why it's so important, because now, because of the Holy Spirit, the ark isn't out there. It's in here. And this is my, my, my ask of you. Will you let God out of the box? No, God, this is your box. This is how you speak. This is how you give me money. This is how my job works. This is how promotions work. God, no, this is your box that you get to operate in. This is your way that you speak. This is how you move. This is where I'll go. I think we are still living in an Old Testament paradigm that God is still in this tiny little box. Well, friend, that spirit got out of the box, and now it doesn't live in a building or a temple or a room. Now it lives on the inside of you. So that is so good news, because that means every day you go to work, the ark is with you. Every day you go to your home, the ark is with you. Every day you go on a trip, the ark is with you. Why? Because now his presence isn't on you. It's in you. If you read the entire Old Testament, it was always the presence of God came on. Came on. It doesn't come on you. Now it lives in you. 
my, my, um, I'd like to submit to you this morning. Will you let God out of your box? You start praying prayers like this. God, however you want to do it. It, it, it. Just be real simple like this. God, 18th month old churches don't buy $2.5 million buildings. That's out of the box, God. Young churches don't start colleges out of nowhere. Young churches don't fill out 800-room auditoriums. No, God, make sure it's in the box. What if we started letting God out of your box? And our prayer wasn't, God, do it this way. God, do it that way. It was, God, you make a way however you want to make a way. You say left, and I go left. You say cross, and I cross. God, will you get out of your box? I'd like to ask you today, are you making God in your image, or is he making you in his? Oh, I love church people. Oh, that was so good. Because what starts happening is we start following God, and we tell God who he is. No, God, this is your box. Do you know what you're doing? You're creating God in your image. But we're not supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be allowing God to make us in his. Simple question today. We are crossing over, are you? And one of the ways that we are crossing collectively and individually is saying we have never been this way before. The presence lead us. The ark, the the spirit of Jesus, the the spirit of God, the presence of God, lead us. Listen to me, I, I just want to tell you as a senior pastor of this church, the future of our church is more presence, not less. It is more worship, not less. It is more prayer nights, not less. We have nothing to give this city. It doesn't matter about a stage, a light, and free food. Without his presence, we are merely a group of people in a club hanging out and talking. The best thing we can offer this riddled, depressed, anxiety-driven city is the very presence of Jesus. And his presence is real. It's authentic. It's tangible. He knows your name. He knows what you're going through. Even right now, you're like, what is going on? It's his spirit knocking on your door saying, can we talk? Can I, can I come in? It's his presence. Moses says in uh, Exodus uh, 33, he goes, I don't want to go if your presence doesn't go before me. Can I just say to you, I don't want to buy a building if his presence doesn't go before me. I don't want to start a college if his presence doesn't go before me. And then he says this phrase. He goes, once it goes before me, then he goes, for your presence is the thing that sets me apart from other nations. Do you know what sets this room apart? It's not free food and waffle window. It's his presence that is setting us apart. Number two, not only are we uh, going to let his presence lead. Number two, put it up. Please, right? The right way might seem like the wrong season. This passage is speaking to me personally. I told God I shouldn't be starting a college and a buying building at the same time. This is the wrong season. I've, I've worked more in the last two and a half months than I ever have in my entire life. I've slept less in the last two and a half months of my entire life doing these two projects, and, and I'm thankful for them, but they've been a lot of work. I told God multiple times, this is the wrong season. This is the, I should put uh, pause on one of them. Look at Joshua 3. They said they get to the banks, and it says the river is overflowing. It's harvest season, which is a very specific time of the year when the waters are filled what is Joshua saying? It doesn't seem like the right season to cross. We should wait till it's not harvest season. So the water's less. So the opposition is less. The difficulty is less. It makes more sense to my sight to wait a few more seasons. It makes sense to my visual to wait a few more seasons till the water is lower. So you like, it makes sense to my visual to wait to serve for a while. It makes sense to my visual not to give for a little bit. It makes sense to my visual not to commit yet. Can I, I just challenge you right now? Often when God is leading you the right way, it usually seems like the wrong season. Start, God's asking you to start a business. I got to wait till quarter one. Nobody starts businesses in quarter three. Exactly. God will often ask you to do things that seem in the wrong season, but it's the right way. The banks are overflowing. Why? Because God will ask you to do things in wrong season so you can't get credit. How did you do that? No one starts businesses like that. No one starts colleges like that. 
No one does nursing that way. No one gets loans and lends that way. No. How did you do it? I didn't. Yeah, it's the wrong season. I know. Because God will ask you to do things right now in your season of life, your marriage, your finances, your schooling, whatever it might be. And it might seem like the right way, but the wrong season. And that's usually a good sign. It's God, because when he does something in your life, the answer should be, I know you. You could have done that. Does your life right now represent your skill or God's? Does what's going on in your life represent his power or yours? Man, I don't know about you, but I want to live such a life of faith that when people look at me, they go, there is no other explanation than God must have worked on your behalf. Because I know you, I know your skill, I know who you are. There's no way you could have accomplished that. I know. Well, how did you start? When did you? Man, it was the wrong season. Seemingly the wrong season. If you're a visitor today and you're like, man, this might be the church for me, jump in. If you've been here for the last like few weeks, and I've met so many people in the lobby, I've been here for two weeks, jump in. And your I will tell you, wait till a better season. I'll submit it this way. The enemy will tell you, wait till a better season. No, just wait a little bit, check the church out, make sure it's good, meet some people, don't give yet, don't serve yet, maybe fill out some other things, maybe try out some other things. And the enemy wants to get you to wait till a better season. But the older you get, start learning, there is no better season. There's no perfect season. There's such a decision. I see a river, God is asking me to cross, and I'm gonna step in, and I'm gonna cross, and I'm gonna believe. Why? Because it might feel like the wrong season. Number three, this is where I want to land for a bit, three and four. All that was introduction. <laughs> Told you, I, go, I got to preach one time today. Look at this. When you step out, he will step in. This phrase jo jumped out to me in Joshua 3. Jo uh, God tells Joshua and the Israelites, I will separate the water. The land is yours. Canaan is yours. I will do it. But notice how the water didn't move until the foot stepped in. Nothing happened. God's word was there. God's promise was there. God's commitment was there. God's covenant was there. But he said, I will do it when the priest's foot touched the water. You know what God says is? I'll wait for you. I wonder how many of you keep telling God, I'm just waiting on you, God. And he's told you, I'm waiting on you. I'm just waiting on you to give me the word. I'm waiting for you to open the door. I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. And God's like, I've been waiting for you for six years. I gave you my promise. I gave you my word. You need to step out. And the minute your foot touches the water, I will start stepping in. Some of you, God has been waiting to step into your marriage for a long time. You need to start stepping out. He's been waiting to step into your finances, but it's time for you to step out. God is faithful to his word. Every time you step out, watch God step in. But he will wait till you step out. Do you know what we're doing starting at college? Stepping out. Do you know what we're doing buying a $2.5 million building with no millions? <laughs> Stepping out. I'm serious. I wonder how many of you, God's waiting on you. And you're at the river. How, how many years are you going to look at the water? How long are you going to stand at the banks and going, man, that, that river will be really fun, the really fun to cross one day. You know, I've prayed about the river. I've tweeted about the river. I've journaled about the river. I've got a tattoo about the river. I mean, I'm telling you, man, one of these days, I'm going to do it. It's been five years. God is waiting for you to go, you know what? It's time for you to step out. And the minute your foot touches the water, God will step in. And walls start going up. And waves start moving. And it becomes dry. But it's only because step out. I love the phrase in Joshua. They, the Bible says they stepped out and they took a few steps into the water. In other words, go stand in the middle of what you want. Go stand in the middle of what you want me to do. Can I ask you today, what do you, what do you need to take some steps into? And start standing in the middle of your finances, the middle of your business, the middle of your marriage, the middle of your kids finding Jesus, the middle of your, your business turning around. God's asking you, step on out. Come on out. It's the wrong season. I know. I'll get the credit that way. I'm not good enough. I know. I'll get the credit. I'm asking you to put your foot on the water. Step out. 
and I will step in. We are crossing over. Are you? We are crossing over as a church. We're crossing over a new season that it will never be the same again, ever. This college in the building and what God's doing in our church will, ne will never be the same again. We are crossing over. Are you coming? My last point, and then I'll say some things before the band comes up and kicks me off. Um, last, number four, put it up. A new land doesn't mean no enemies. Do you know what's amazing? This Canaan was the promised land of God. And if you read ongoing after chapter three and then chapter four, what is their first day in the new country? Jericho. Right, the walls of Jericho going around seven times. Isn't it fascinating that even God's perfect promise covenant land still had enemies? But good news, they've already been defeated. You just have to occupy the land. Oh, we're buying a building, we're starting a college. Here comes new enemies. It's not just we're gonna walk into this thing and all oh, the doors are gonna open and all the stuff's gonna be done and college was easy and we're gonna have 100 applicants and nothing's gonna go wrong and everything's gonna be great. No, when you occupy new land, new territory, there's gonna be enemies. But they've already been defeated. But what was God's promise? Wherever your foot touches is yours. Right, right? So if I'm here and wherever my foot touches is mine, no wonder the enemies over there are still battling because I haven't moved into the territory yet. My foot hasn't touched there yet. And you're like, I'm not moving until they leave. And God's like, they won't leave till you move. No, there's enemies, God, in the new land, the new finances, the new business, the new entrepreneurial thing, the new freelancing. There's enemies. I'll wait till they leave. And God's like, they'll leave when you occupy the land. Because I told you, wherever your foot goes is yours. Do you know what we're doing buying a building? Putting our foot somewhere. Putting our foot down in physical territory. Starting a college, putting our foot down in physical territory. Why? Because we are, we're stepping out. We're waiting for God to step in. We're crossing over. Next weekend, and this is where I'll land. Next weekend, we are starting a series. Jake, they have that slide, yeah? Thanks, Dad. Next weekend, we are starting a series called All In, Risking Everything for Changed Lives. I'm all in. And I'm gonna risk everything for changed lives lives. We're not risking everything for a building. We're not risking everything for an area code. We're not risking everything for brick and mortar and paint and carpet. We're risking everything for changed lives. <laughs> Next weekend, we start our journey of raising $500,000. And I said that pretty specific. We're not gonna try to raise it. We are going to raise it. But we need you. Listen, I'm very aware, and I'll say this again next weekend for those who couldn't come today. I'm very aware I am out from the boat. I'm on the water. And I'm asking, would you join me? I'll be real forthright. Would you trust me? Would you follow me? Would you cross over? Because we're doing it. And I'm asking you to join me. I'm asking for a couple things. Number one, be at church next weekend. We're gonna do a six week series between October 13th and November 24th seven weeks, a series called All In, we're risking everything. If you wanna write this down, November 24th is our Give Sunday. If you wanna start praying about numbers and finances and moving things around, November 24th is where we're gonna take that offering. And I'm, I'm personally, just so you know, my, I don't know if I should even say it. 
my prayer number is $1 million, by the way, not $500,000. A million dollars. To have finances to remodel the building, to put money down, to have our monthly payments lower, uh, to get ready for the college. Um, an aspect of it is one of the rooms, and by the way, the new building is gonna be for autistic kids. We're gonna have a sensory room for autistic kids and families. Which you're aware that that takes a whole other level of lighting and toys and whatever, but like, we're gonna do it. We are crossing over. And I'm very aware that you're like, money's an iffy thing for me anyway. And I had church hurt. Welcome to the club. We meet on Tuesday nights. There's 6,000 of us. Come hang out. Listen, I'm, I'm trying to take the air out of the room. Like, I know I'm asking something big. I, I know I am. I'm young to some of you. I'm old to some of you, which is sucky. In fact, I've had to use the term back in my day a few times with, with some of you. I hate you so much. I, I understand that this is a big room. We're moving in something big. And I know you have to like trust and money and finances and buildings and college. There's a lot going on. There will always be a lot going on. Because I refuse to take over a neighborhood. We're taking over a city. And yeah, we're 18 months old and we're new. And I'm just, I'm simply being real vulnerable before you. Join me. Join us. Be at church next weekend and don't miss for seven weeks. I know some of you are like, I usually don't. We'll make sure you don't. Some of you are like, well, I want to go to church every weekend. Would you come every weekend? Some of you are like, brand new. We'll see you next weekend. But I fully am aware. Some of you are like, this is a lot. It is. Join us for the journey. Join us on what God's going to do. Because come come one day, we're going to get into that building and you're going to look behind and go, I remember giving that $100 and now my mom has been saved, my son has been saved, my neighbor has been saved, I helped purchase those toys, I helped put carpet in, I helped paint that, I am so thankful, I'm, I'm a part of something much bigger than myself, Jesus, would you use me, help me cross over, help me move over, help me think bigger, help me think